And just to give you a little bit of background to the reason for today's sermon is that about five years ago, I preached through the entire book of Leviticus as a sermon series because nobody wants to read Leviticus, right? So kind of gave, laid a groundwork so when you're reading through the entirety of the Bible, uh, you don't get stuck on Leviticus. If you actually understand it, it's a really interesting book. But what that sermon did is it completely messed me up psychologically to like the clean and unclean foods in the Bible. And so I thought, let's, let's kind of revisit this a little bit. And maybe you guys can pull me out of like what's going on with me. Who knows? Um, I'm, I'm kidding. But, you know, so I wanted to preach today on the clean and unclean foods. And I'm going to talk about it in light of the New Testament. You know, the first thing that I want to make very clear is that we are free in Christ. There's liberty in Christ. Jesus declared all foods clean, all creatures clean. And so that's, that's a given. I just want to make sure that, that we understand that uh, as a groundwork for today's sermon. And we're also going to have a Q&A session at the very end because I have a feeling this is kind of a sermon that will, you know, raise a lot of questions. So, and I think that's good. You know, as a New Testament church, we're supposed to have discussion and dialogue and do all of that. So I want to keep that up and to make it easy for uh editing on the audio. We're going to do all that at the very end, and we'll get into a deeper discussion that way. Um, All right, so with all of that, a few things that I just want to begin this sermon with is that according to the Old Testament, by God's design, there were certain creatures that God had made for food, again, talking about the Old Testament, And there's other creatures that God made that serve different purposes, from hauling your goods to farming and to tilling to scavenger animals whose sole job it was to eat carcasses of creatures that had died to clean the earth to animals that were made for food. And so that's kind of how God looked at it from the Old Testament perspective. And this is where God's clean and unclean food laws came in. Now, so today we're going to be in Leviticus 11, as I mentioned. That's where most of the food laws are covered, in addition to parts of Deuteronomy, talking about clean and unclean food laws. And just another disclaimer I want to make very clear is that this is not a Hebrew root sermon. You know, so people that are looking for that, that are thinking that might find this like as the sermon video and think, oh, you know, we're going to learn all about the Old Testament dietary laws. Well, you are, but again, we're going to look at it from a New Testament perspective because, you know, our church name is New Covenant Baptist Church, right? So we're a New Covenant Church. We're not an Old Covenant Church. And we filter our understanding of the Bible through the lens of the New Testament. That's one of the you know, laws of exegesis, the rules of proper exegesis, is that we have the hindsight of the New Testament to give us insight into the Old Testament, even though the Old Testament kind of lays the groundwork for everything that's in the New Testament. So they're symbiotic in that way, but we have the New Testament understanding to to give us insight. And so, you know, to be clear, we honor the entirety of the Bible from the old to the new. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the New Testament makes it clear that all scripture is good for edification and doctrine and understanding and wisdom. So we're not like hyper dispensationalists where we just say it's only the New Testament and we just... We never look at the old. You know, I've, I've been to churches like that, and I, and I ran right out, you know. Um, so under the terms of the New Covenant or the New Testament, Jesus is very clear about what you can and cannot eat. You know, when Peter had a vision uh, of all the four-footed beasts of the earth and all the fowls of the air and all the creeping things, when he saw the clean and the unclean all together in this sheet, in this vision of this sheet with all the animals coming down, he was commanded to eat. And we're going to cover that in Acts 10 at the very end. But just to give you a snippet of it, when he was commanded to eat, Peter objected in Acts 10, 14, verse 14 through 15, says, but Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not not thou common. 
So Jesus says here, right, you know, directly that he's made all creatures clean, uh, all the animals that he saw, all the creeping things, the fowls of the air, the beasts of the earth, all the things that were formerly unclean, he said, don't call those things common or unclean. I've cleansed all things. God has cleansed all things through the blood of the lamb. Now, of course, that was in context of evangelism and salvation. Uh, you know, it was, the, it was the evangelism of the Gentile world, the Romans and the, and the Greek world, basically, that Peter was going to go evangelize. This was in context of a Roman named Cornelius, which we'll get to in a minute. You know, that was the main context, was that the uh, clean and unclean foods represented the Gentiles versus the Jews, you know, initially. But... God never only spiritualizes things. His word should be taken literally and at face value. And so when he says that he's made all foods clean or all creatures clean, I, I take that literally. You know, he's not going to use a, a common example or a daily example uh, to bring out about a greater truth, but not really have any root in, in what he's saying. So I believe he was speaking about the Gentiles, the Greeks, you know, versus the Jews. The gospel's been open to everybody now, but he was also directly speaking about the food. So the New Testament clearly teaches that all foods are clean. You can have your pick of the creatures and, and what to eat, right? Um, and so, of course, there are Hebrew Ruth fanatics, and, and I don't mean to disparage them. There are many good people that get, you know, deceived into this, that, that are lacking something in, in modern Christianity, with all the churches, you know, kind of being empty and falling away in many ways. And they, and they cling to this idea of the Hebrew roots and get sucked in. Uh, but, you know, the Hebrew roots people will fall into this and they point to this passage and say that really was only in regards to evangelism and that you still can't eat bacon. And if that you're eating bacon, if you're eating pork, if you're eating shellfish, that you're in sin and you're not honoring God's commandments. But again, we know that we're not under the law. We're under the terms of the New Testament under grace. So, again, want to make that very clear. Um, but to, to kind of give evidence against what they teach and the way they interpret it, we can also look at Romans 14.14 14 to the words of Paul. Paul says in Romans 14.14, 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. So he literally says that there is nothing unclean unclean of itself. You might say, based on that statement, that Paul was a hypergracer, you know, that all things are permissible, that nothing's unclean. And of course, you know, that's, that deserves another sermon in and of itself, which I'm sure I'll get to and talk about antinomianism and hypergrace. I think that would be a good, good topic to cover. But then Paul says, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So in Romans 14, he's kind of giving us the choice. You know, he's saying all things are clean in the context of Romans 14 is food and drink. Um, and he's saying all things are clean. So we have a direct statement from Paul the Apostle interpreting Jesus saying it isn't just in terms of evangelism. That may have been the primary context, but it's also a literal statement about food. Okay, so the Bible is clear, and I'm not going to condemn or stop anyone from eating what they want. And, um, you know, we'll touch on this a bit more at the end of the sermon. But with that, let's take a look at Leviticus 11 and the unclean and clean food laws, the clean and unclean food laws. And what I want to do is just give you the law. I'm just going to give you what the law says, what the Levitical law says, and answer what foods are clean and unclean according to God's word in the Old Testament and why. Okay, and after the sermon, you should be able to look at any creature that God has made, any animal, any fish, any bird, any even insect. You know, there's certain insects that are clean according to God's word. And you should be able to recognize and to know which foods are clean and unclean according to God's word. There are very simple rules that God lays out and gives us that knowledge in his word. So that's kind of the purpose for this sermon. And then you decide for yourself what you want to eat and not eat, basically, according to the terms of the New Testament. 
So with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn to Leviticus 11. And uh, we'll begin right there in Leviticus 11, verse 1, if you're there in your Bibles. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So the Bible here begins with the beasts of the earth, or what we today call mammals. So that's, that's the first part that, that the Bible covers, are the, are the mammals or the beasts. And there are certain mammals that we want to eat, and there are certain mammals that we don't want to eat. For example, I'm not really interested in eating a dog or a cat or a coyote, you know, or a fox. Like coyotes are nasty, right? So I don't really want to eat a coyote. Something innately tells me that that's probably not a good idea. Uh, you know, whether that's, that's social conditioning or, or something else, the Bible in the Old Testament had certain rules. And so it wasn't just random or based on social conditioning or environment in the Bible, in the Old Testament, but on which creatures God had made for food and for other reasons and other purposes, other you know, functions that they served, and which creatures God had made you know, to eat. And so Leviticus tells us that in order for an animal or a beast to be clean, it needs to be and to be considered food, it must have hooves, which are parted. That means to be cloven-footed. So like a, a horse has, has hooves, but it doesn't have the part in the middle. Whereas a goat, sheep, other animals, cows, they have that, that split right in the middle of their hoof. So an an, for an animal to be clean, it needs to have cloven feet, basically, or that, that, the hooves need to be split in half. That's the first condition. The second condition, what's that, Steve? Except for a pig. A pig has a, has a cloven foot, yeah. right? And so there's two conditions. That, that brings up a good point. There are two conditions that have to be met. One is the cloven feet, and the second condition is that the animal needs to chew the cud. So you, you know, the farm, people who are farmers and are familiar with animals know what that, what that is. Um, you know, it, there's two chambers in, in the stomach of, of most of these animals that chew the cud, and they literally, you know, swallow the grass and whatever else that they eat, and, and it gets fermented in those chambers, comes back up, they chew it again, and then it goes through that process. So there's a, we'll get into that a little bit more, but for example, a camel or a horse has hooves, but it has that solid hoof. It's not split in the middle, and so they're not cloven-footed, right? So a horse, camel, uh, other animals that don't have that uh, split hoof. And so while a horse and a camel, they do chew the cud. They actually do chew the cud. You see the horse kind of, you know, they're always chewing on that grass, right? They're chewing the cud, uh, but they're not cloven-footed. And so therefore, horses, camels are unclean according to the Bible, now, the same could be said for the pig, right? Because they do have the cloven feet, but they don't chew the cud. They just eat, you know, they just devour whatever you give them and, and they eat it. So um, those are, you know, the conditions. There are two conditions for mammals that need to be met for them to be biblically kosher, so to speak, or, or clean. You know, again, this is according to the Old Testament. You're free in Christ. If you want to have your bacon, if you, if you can't give up your bacon, you know, that's fine. You don't have to give up your bacon in order to be a Christian, okay? So examples, ex yeah, examples of cloven-footed mammals also include cattle, you know, like cows. Uh, so it's no wonder that we eat them, right? Also deer, elk, antelope, goat, sheep. And surprisingly, also the giraffe. The giraffe has cloven feet and chews the cud. So that was kind of a, you know, I didn't know that till this sermon. I was looking up different animals. And so all of these are edible according to the Old Testament because they both chew the cud and have cloven feet. Okay, so um, we kind of covered already, you know, pigs don't, don't chew the cud, but they have cloven feet. And again, we covered a little bit what is chewing the cud. 
Um, you know, a lot of that is that special digestive system that God created for these animals that would, um, you know, have these multiple chambers in the stomach. It would ferment the plant-based foods that they would eat. So it's a much cleaner system in a way. So some of this isn't random. Uh, you know, there, there are reasons for it in, in the Old Testament, I believe. Now, compare this to, you know, like the pig, like I said, will just eat anything that you throw at it. It doesn't chew the cud. It doesn't have that digestive system. Pigs, in a way, are like a trash compactor, you know, that any kind of waste that you throw at them, they're going to eat. They'll eat it up. So they're kind of like God's natural trash disposal. Now, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not religious about this, right? Um, the New Testament says you can eat bacon if you want. And I, I ate bacon most of my life, but my own sermon messed me up, you know, from, from doing this back about five years ago when I preached on Leviticus. So <clears throat> now I'm not going to judge you, you know, if you eat bacon, so that's fine. But for, you know, psychological reasons and for health reasons also, I've chosen not to eat pork. Um, but again, I'm not super religious about it because if you throw a pizza at me, it, it better have pepperoni on it. And I don't want to know, like, is it pork? Is it beef yeah, pepperoni? Pork yeah, like I don't, I just... Shut off my mind. I don't want to know like what kind of pepperoni it is, and I'm going to eat it and love it, you know. And so that's fine. Again, this isn't about being religious about this. There's no sin in eating pork. You know, the New Testament is very clear. Okay, so you know we're we're free in Christ, and and we can do that. Let's continue in Leviticus 11, four through eight. <clears throat> Okay, so that was the mammals. And then verse 4, Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch, they are unclean to you. And so this is repeated again in Deuteronomy 14. The word dut or de is Latin for two. You know, that's that French word de or dut is to, it comes from the Latin. And so Deuteronomy is a repetition of, the, of Leviticus. It's like the second telling of the law, the second time the law is, is, is displayed or, or read in, in God's word. And so we get a double witness in God's word. We get the same thing. Deuteronomy repeated and expanded on the laws from Leviticus which is the law of the Levite, and we get in Deuteronomy 14, 3 through 8, thou shalt not any abominable thing, these are the beasts which ye shall eat, the ox, the sheep, and the goat, the hart, and the roebuck, and the fallow deer, and the wild goat, and the pygarg, and the wild ox, and the chamois, and every beast that parteth the hoof, and cleaveth the cleft into two claws, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat, Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven hoof, as the camel, and the hare, and the coney, for they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. <clears throat> Therefore they are unclean unto you, and the swine, because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, it is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass." So just like I mentioned earlier, there are certain requirements that had to be met. There are those two requirements in order for them to be clean. All right, and then we get to the fish and to, to ocean and lake and water creatures. And that's covered in Leviticus 9 through 12. <clears throat> it says, These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. In all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters and of any living thing which is in the waters, 
They shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. <clears throat> Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. So the rule is simple for sea creatures or, or water creatures. They need to have fins and they need to have scales. Uh, like most fish, you know, most fish have scales and they have fins, but not all. So there's certain fish that are technically considered unclean. Uh, examples of clean fish include most salmon, uh, trout, halibut, tuna, cod, whitefish. You know, these are most of the common fish. Some of you are getting hungry, I think, from this sermon. Um, examples of unclean fish include catfish. Okay, so catfish, while, while are, they're delicious fried, right? If you've ever had like southern catfish, uh, when they're uh, battered and fried, they're unclean because they don't have scales. So that's one of the requirements. They need to have scales and fins. Catfish, it kind of makes sense because they're also bottom dwellers, meaning that they're scavengers who feed off of the dead food that falls to the, you know, to the bottom of the lakes, to the ocean, not the ocean floor, but the lake floor, you know, uh, or ponds. And so, you know, they're eating all the dead stuff. They're the scavenger kind of fish. And so that, that's why also shellfish like crab, lobster, and shrimp, which I think are delicious, you know, um, but they're also considered unclean. Uh, they don't have scales or fins, so that's how you know right away that they're unclean animals. Uh, they also live off the bottom of rivers and the ocean beds, and they scavenge off the bottom. So basically, these are the kinds of creatures, you know, whereas you get like cattle and deer, they're just grazing off the wild grasses, they're chewing the cud, it's getting filtered in their stomachs. You know, it's a cleaner system, so to speak, even literally when it comes to, you know, physically perhaps. Uh, whereas you get these bottom dwellers that are eating all the dead, you know, decayed, you know, dead flesh from other creatures. What's that? Don't ruin it. Yeah, that's what I mean. This sermon totally messed me up. So I'm like, I'm either going to bring you guys with me or you're going to bring me back, you know. So <laughs> you're going to help me out, you know, of where I put myself, you know. So, so that's kind of, you know, that's the fish uh, and the uh, ocean creatures. And then the Bible then moves on to the birds or to the fowls of the air. The Bible calls them fowls because um, they fly. Leviticus eleven thirteen through 19. And these are they which you shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ostrich and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind. Every raven after his kind, and the owl, and the night hawk, and the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the gyre eagle, and the stork, the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. So the Bible is just specifically lists like here are the you know birds that you cannot eat. You know these are the unclean birds. I mean, does anyone really want to eat an eagle or a vulture or a bat? You know, so in China, I guess they eat some of these, you know, they eat bats and, and different dogs and cats. And so, you know, this is kind of common sense in a way when it comes to which foods or which creatures God made clean and unclean. And so there's some rhyme and reason to it, you know, to which animals are, are intended for food. And there's that old adage, you are what you eat. You know, so you're consuming these, you know, these creatures, you are what you eat. Now, again, you're free to eat uh, what you want in Christ. But when I studied this out, I'm like, well, you know, some things kind of make sense. So not as a religious thing, but as a health thing or as a as just psychologically, you know, I don't want to eat a, a bat. Um, and so I had that paradigm shift, in, you know, about five years ago. Uh, and this is where I'm at. But. You know, so why are we unwilling to eat dogs and and cats and vultures, but we're okay eating pig and shrimp and lobster? You know, what you know, what changed in our maybe it was it like a, maybe we're conditioned to it in our society? You know, I don't know. These are just kind of questions that that popped up in, in my mind. You know, why did we make exceptions for those unclean animals versus other unclean animals? 
And so these are just questions to ponder, you know, do with it what you will. I just want to give you the law, give you God's word, and then you're free to choose what you want. Now we get to the insects. Uh, We get to what the Bible calls the creeping things. And this is covered in Leviticus 11, 20 through 22. All fowls that creep going upon all four shall be an abomination unto you. So he's talking about the insects that, you know, that are crawling, creeping things. Verse 21, yet these may you eat of every flying creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap withal upon the earth. It's kind of like the grasshopper there, right? They have wings and they leap. Verse 22, even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. So according to the Bible, uh, locusts and grasshoppers and beetles are clean. They're actually just a normal food according to, you know, to Jewish dietary restrictions. It wasn't like considered weird, you know, you're eating a grasshopper or you know, and so if you remember John the Baptist, it said just very matter of factly, his diet was locusts and wild honey. So John the Baptist really was eating locusts. You know, some people try to explain that away and say it was a kind of a, a fruit off of a plant that was also called a locust. No, it was the grasshopper looking type of locust that John the Baptist was eating. And he was, uh, you know, he was a Nazarite, I believe, John the Baptist, and he was very strict with following all of the Jewish, you know, laws and the food laws of the Old Testament. So John the Baptist was not, you know, sinning by eating the locusts. That was one of the clean, clean foods. So they say they're, you know, high form of protein. So, um, so those are the insects that you can according to the Old Testament, eat the, the uh, grasshopper, locust, and the beetle. <clears throat> Verse 23. But all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. So a cockroach, you know, doesn't have the same characteristics that you don't want. I don't think you want to eat that, right? Verse 24. And for these you shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even, and whosoever beareth out of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. So this also tells us the fact that you had to wash your clothes and you had to be ceremonially unclean also points us to the fact that there were ceremonial reasons or spiritual reasons for this. It wasn't just about eating, you know, what kinds of foods you can eat. Because you couldn't go before God in the temple if you had eaten something unclean or touched the carcass of an unclean animal. And so this was God's way to separate his people from the nations of the world. This was one way that God's people could be separate and distinct in the Old Testament. And that's where, you know, we get that divide gets, gets demolished in the New Testament by the blood of Jesus, where now the foods are all made clean because now the Gentile nations and the Jewish nation can all, you know, work together. It's kumbaya now with all the different peoples, as long as you believe in Jesus, you know, as long as you believe in Christ. There's no more divide. There's no more clean nations, unclean nations, clean people, unclean people. And so that's what ultimately this represented and pointed to. Okay, so Leviticus eleven twenty six through 27 the carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven-footed nor cheweth the cud are unclean unto you. Everyone that toucheth them shall be unclean, and whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean unto you. Whoso toucheth their carcasses shall be unclean until the even. So now we get to animals with paws. It's another classification of animals, not just the cloven feet uh, or the solid uh, hoof that isn't cloven, but also paws. You know, if they have, if there's an animal with paws, that basically that's just unclean. There's no exception to that according to the Old Testament. So a dog, fox, coyote, a wolf, a bear, lions, cats, you know, that those would all be considered unclean. Uh, that would also include rabbit, squirrel, you know, all of these kind of kind of foods 
uh, you know, which rabbits are, you know, which are scientifically, they're cute little fuzzy rodents, right? They're just, they're cute, but they're still rodents. So that's where the paws and, and all of that come in. These were all considered to be unclean. Now, again, if your conscience is clear of having these animals, go for it. You know, it's not a sin. It's just, it comes down to personal preference, personal choice. Leviticus eleven twenty eight through 30 and he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. They are unclean unto you. These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind and the ferret and the chameleon and the lizard and the snail. There goes escargot if anyone yeah. <laughs> probably didn't like that anyway, right? Um, and the mole. So we see in this list, we see lizards, we see reptiles, that would include snakes, right? So all the reptiles would be considered unclean in the Bible. And, um, and so, you know, this is pretty much the, the comprehensive uh, list. You know, he goes through the mammals, the, the birds, the insects, the, the uh, uh, you know, animals with paws, turtles, everything, right? It's all... It's all covered in here. So this is the list of clean and unclean foods. And, you know, I think about our American diet, things that we're used to eating that are considered normal, uh, but were considered unclean in the Bible, mostly pork and shellfish, you know, of course, is, are the big ones. Um, but then for some of the more exotic, you've got the squirrel, rabbit, snake, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, I don't, again, I don't think most of us are interested in eating horses um, camels, you know, even giraffes kind of seem weird, but they are clean. So um, dogs, coyotes, you know, all of that. So this is the list according to the Levitical priesthood. Okay, if you want to be like strict by the law of God and, you know, the law is good and edifying, uh, then fine. But we're no longer under the Le Levitical priesthood, as you know. We're under the priesthood of Melchizedek, under Jesus, all foods have been made clean. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, we're free in Christ. And so this isn't a judgment call. It's not a commandment. I'm not going to, you know, judge you for eating pork and you shouldn't judge me for not eating pork. You know, so it's that's that's what the Bible ultimately concludes. So it's not only it's not like a Muslim thing where you don't eat pork. It's also a Jewish thing. You know, it could be a a Christian thing, you know, for me, it's, it's a health thing and it's a psychological thing. I'm just, I'm just strict and weird about my foods, you know? Um, so like for me, like, you know, I also don't eat, uh, GMO foods, you know, I, uh, I'm just more strict with the foods that, that I eat. So this kind of, it's like taking it to a new level for me by even trying to be semi kosher when it's convenient, you know, not as, not as like a religious thing. You know, so I only try to eat non-GMO, organic, grass-fed. Um, I don't like preservatives in my food. I don't like chemical food coloring in my food, like, you know, red, yellow, Lake 40 or, or whatever else. You know, those aren't food. I don't believe that God intended for us to, to eat. You know, I don't think he intended it for us to fill our bodies with chemicals and, and food coloring and preservatives. Um, that's why we see, you know, there's much cancer in our society and there's digestive health problems in, in our society. It's pretty rampant in our society because we'll just eat anything, you know, just put in a can and put some color on it and make it look good and, and we'll eat it. So, you know, I think there's some, there's some truth, you know, there's truth to this. You just take it with a grain of salt in terms of where you are spiritually and, and, and what, you know, you're free. And so you just need to make up your own mind on that. But I believe in a natural, healthy, organic diet, uh, the way that God intended foods to be. You know, that's, that's how he created us. You know, cows, for example, they weren't meant to be penned up and shot full of antibiotics and hormones. You know, that, that's not how God created cattle uh, to be. <laughs> so, you know, they were created, cows were created. Uh, they weren't created to feed on corn and grain, they were created to graze on grasses. And so that's why I only eat grass fed meat when I can, you know. So um, it's just, again, personal preference. 
And ultimately, it just comes down to Romans 14. Let's take just a little bit of a deeper look at Romans 14. Romans 14, 2 through 4. It says, For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. And then look at Romans 14, 14, just a little further down. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So again, it just comes down to your own personal conscience. You know, is it a sin for you to eat pork? If it's not, go for it. Eat pork. Is it, does it bother your conscience, you know, from a health perspective? If it doesn't, then go for it. You know, it's, it's up to you. It's really what, what Romans is saying. We all, we all have to make our own personal decisions. Look down then a little further at Romans 17 through 22. It says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. And don't worry, you can eat pork in front of me, and it's not going to bother me. You know, that's okay. Uh, Has thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that command, com, uh, condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. So he's saying just do it with a clear conscience before God. It's between you and God in the New Testament. So in other words, we're all adults and we make our own decisions. So let no one despise your freedom in Christ. So, you know, um, there are also times, uh, just kind of as the last point here to kind of, then we'll look at Acts 10 and a couple verses uh, before we close out. But uh, there's also times in, the, in, in life when someone is going to set food before you and you just, you're, the Bible just commands you to just eat it, you know, and, and don't make a big fuss over it. And we see that in Jesus speaking in Luke 10, verse 8. And he says, And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Okay? And this was in context of evangelism. Jesus was sending the disciples to evangelize the Roman nation, the Greek nation, the Gentile nations. And he knew that these people that were going to give, you know, give them, like let them into their homes and set food before them, that they were not all Jewish. And so he was saying, don't hinder the preaching of the gospel because of your dietary food laws in the Old Testament, eat whatever they put in front of you when you're evangelizing. In other words, there's a specific reason why he said that, because the apostles were all Jewish believers who had, you know, were strict on the food laws from their, you know, from their, you know, childhood up, right? So they were raised on these Jewish food laws. So um, he didn't want the gospel to be hindered. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 10, 27. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscious sake. So here he specifically says these are for those who don't believe. Whatever they give you to eat, probably not going to be a clean food. Just don't ask. Don't say anything. Eat it. Be polite. You know, and uh, because, again, the gospel was the real mission and he didn't want that work to be hindered. <clears throat> All right, Jesus also said in Mark 7, and he saith unto them, verse 18, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly? 
and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So again, Jesus was focused on the inner man, on the spiritual things, rather than the physical, carnal things, food, drink, that really have no bearing in the kingdom of God. It doesn't really matter. You know, so take no offense, you know, to what people eat. It doesn't really matter, you know, uh, ultimately. Just make your own personal decisions. First Timothy 4, 1 through 5 uh, also says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry which is kind of could come in with the LGBT thing, let's just scrap the whole thing, right? Um, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So nothing means nothing, you know, you don't have to, uh, you know, basically all things are food uh, or clean if you want it to be and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, right? So um, again, this is one of those verses where as we go into the end times, uh, there's like, there could be meat shortages and there could be different issues where they just literally make it illegal to have meat and to eat meat. There's a company now called Beyond Meat. You know, I'm following stock, the stock market and all this. Not a company I'm invested in, but that's like one of the big stocks everyone's talking about because, you know, it's Beyond Meat. They're, it's like a vegetarian kind of a company, right? Um, so that's an upcoming trend. You know, we need to be aware that uh, these things uh, could be coming in the, in the future, uh, incrementally, little by little, they do it in a way that you yourself will choose it. You know, well, you yourself will want to. Not, not you, Steve, and not me. That's for sure, you know. But, but that's sort of, you know, that's the trend. So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, so that tells us that there are going to be people that, that will try to forbid you from eating certain meats, uh, even when it comes to, like, the Hebrew roots issues. You know, they might forbid you to eat pork or, or different foods. Um, but you're free in Christ to do so. Let's go ahead and close out with Acts 10. <clears throat> Acts 10, and I'm just going to read portions of it. I'm going to start at verse 9. So the context of Acts 10 is Cornelius, a Roman, has a vision and uh, he's about to get saved. And, and Peter also has a vision. This was God's supernatural way of connecting Peter with Cornelius. And in verse 9, uh, we're at Peter now in verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a tra trance. <clears throat> Hang on one sec. Okay, fell into a trance, verse 11, <clears throat> and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, all the things that we just read, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. 
And so this was, again, in context of evangelism. You know, this was God saying to Peter in a way that he could understand it, that the Gentiles, don't call the Gentiles unclean. You know, they had laws about even eating with the Gentiles. He was saying now, you know, they're no longer unclean because of the new covenant, because of the blood of the lamb. They could now be saved. And so don't call them unclean. Go to, go to Cornelius and get him saved. You know, he's a brother in Christ because he believes. Um, and so that's, that's the context. And we go further down uh, into verse 20. Let's go to verse 28. And it says, and he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me, this is Peter, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So again, this just verifies that this vision, ultimately, the, the primary application was it was about the Gentile nation. It was about preaching the gospel. He literally says that I shouldn't call any man common or unclean. But again, I do believe that secondarily, you know, God doesn't just randomly use certain examples to confuse people. Now, is it clean? Are foods clean, unclean? It's literal and it's spiritual at the same time. I believe that's how God's word uh, works in most instances. And so I do believe that we are free in Christ. Paul said that there's nothing unlawful to him. You know, nothing is unlawful under the new covenant, but not all things are for edification. Not all things edify. Not all things are good, is, is what he says, which kind of leads into the hypergrace uh, antinomian sermon. I think I should cover not sure when I'll do that one, but I do want to get into that as well and talk about, you know, the law and, and are we truly, you know, under the law in any way uh, or are we just completely free in Christ? Of course, the law is the standard. It's, it's good. Paul says the law is good, you know, um, and so but we're but we're under a new schoolmaster. We're under grace. We're under Christ. Uh, but the basis for all of that is is ultimately goes back to the law. The law is God's you know, original intention uh, for man. So with that, um, did I change anyone over to not eating pork or are you guys all still like, like didn't do a thing, huh? Okay. I don't, I don't eat pork. Either. You don't eat pork. Don't eat pork. Yeah. Because of, because of Leviticus. It got you too, huh? <laughs> yeah. Because it makes sense. Like all the stuff that God mentions to them not to eat are things that, you know, like either eat other things <laughs> Right. Like the birds, those are all hunting birds that eat other things, you know? They're birds of prey, right. They're yeah. eating other flesh, dead flesh a lot of times, versus the cows which eat grass, plant-based foods, and, and all of that. So I think there's something to it, but it's not a religious thing in any way, you know? Yeah. So with that, you know, I can't even convince, you know, my own wife, you know, she's still like, nope, got to love my bacon and the kids. So I'm the only one, you know, in my own family. So... <laughs> Um, so are, are there any questions or was that or comments or was that pretty comprehensive? I do love a good lobster, I have to say. Yeah, or like shrimp or something. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Sushi is my top. That's like among my favorite foods for sure. Yeah, but your sushi is just fish. Fish, salmon. Yeah, salmon, tuna. So I'm just not going to eat the sea urchin, you know, at, at when I get sushi or something. I'll eat the uh, the tuna and the salmon. So. Yeah. Well, if it's any consolation. Yeah. Um, fat, which pork is a lot of fat, um, it stores all the toxins. Mm. So like our bodies, our fat stores toxins, and animals, their fat stores toxins. Interesting. Fat, which is bacon, which I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's full of toxins. Right. Yeah, and the pigs have. It's a good point. They don't. They actually have like a line that runs down their leg that's like a sewer drain, because they don't. They. They don't have sweat glands. Yeah, they're like they're. they're that's why they taste kind of salty, I think, because yeah. they they don't have sweat glands. And they have like. You know, <gasps> I'm like totally ruining bacon for you, right? They I know. Like you guys wish you didn't come to church. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I, when I bring this up to people, 
they will say that was before we had refrigerators, which is a ridiculous excuse. Right. Okay, like that is not why God said that. Because then why would the other meat be okay? Right. Okay, that's so true. Like, and then, right. And then that's not why they could start eating meat. They could start eating meat again, and they still didn't have refrigerators. You right. Yes. Like, I don't like yeah. when people say that to me because I'm like that's. That's just, you're just saying yeah. that. And it's very interesting about the fat, too. I didn't know that that's where the toxins are stored. And so that's interesting yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, now if you eat pig, I recommend like grass fed from like a local farm, you know, is a lot better because there was the parasite yeah, issue. Sauce yeah, <laughs> lots of barbecue. Do, do you yeah. think that like the reason why God didn't want the Jewish people to eat things that were unhealthy was because of the Jewish trying to keep that line as healthy and pure as he could before Jesus came. It's it's possible, yeah. And then like after Jesus came and left, they didn't need to be like becoming offensive to every like country that they went to. Yeah. I mean, if you were trying to, you know, preach the gospel, but then you're like, well, everything you're eating and doing and your whole, you know, everything you do is wrong. You know, right. then that would like completely like turn everybody off. Right. Yeah, it could be. It's hard to speculate. I don't know the reason, all the reasons why. Maybe just general health, you know, and it's just God's ideal has like, he sets a perfect standard that none of us can, can attain to. But I was surprised. I know a lot of serious grace preachers like Nori Davis and others that I know that I was surprised they don't eat, they eat clean also. Like, I didn't know that, you know, and they, they also are, are kind of like me where, 90% of the time I don't, you know, I'm, again, I'm not super religious about it, but uh, I just found it an interesting topic. I wanted to at least give you guys the tools to, to decide and look at the list and go, well, now I know why the fox isn't, un, you know, isn't clean, or now I know why the pig isn't uh, clean, and whereas the deer is, or, you know, so you have all those, uh, the basis to decide. So unless you guys have any other questions, we'll just, uh, our comments will Close it out in a, in a word of prayer. Yes, Jerry. Horses chew the cud. Do the horses chew the cud? They don't. Oh, do no, horses? You know? Oh. Split hoof, they they don't, I know they don't they, have a split they hoof. Hold, uh, like grass or whatever. Oh. Ah. I don't think they like. I don't think ah. they have the Okay. Hoof. Okay. Good to know. I just thought they did because they're always like chewing the cud. Like it looks like they're chewing the cud, but they're not. They're just holding the grass. So they're totally unclean then on on both counts. Interesting. Okay, good to know. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, you guys, we'll uh, close out in prayer and uh, hope you enjoyed the sermon. I just wanted to break out with a topical. Uh, I'm deciding for next week uh, whether we're going to be back in Hebrews next week or I might wait a, a week to bump us back to the normal schedule. Uh, so I'll kind of think about that. But either way, we'll be here preaching uh, next week. And uh, Thanks for your prayers. You know, I did have just that, that good old-fashioned cold, and I'm all better. So, you know, I kind of sound a little bit bad still. Uh, all right, guys, let's uh, end with a word of prayer. We, we thank you, God. We praise your name for your, for your word, for the truth of your word, uh, for the freedom that we have in Christ, God, that this isn't like a one-shoe-fits-all kind of a sermon uh, but one thing we do know is that your scripture is clear about grace and about the terms of the new covenant, which we ultimately uphold in this church, God, uh, more than anything else. Just fundamentally, that's that's the most important thing. And, uh, you know, the kingdom of heaven is more than just food and drink. Uh, so we thank you. We praise you. I pray for blessing and healing and prosperity. I just pray that you give us a really great week, God. Um, and you just be with us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.